nice to be here. I've never been in this place, this part of, of, of the country, and I'm really happy to, to finally meet the partners, the rest of the partners, as for this, the ideal project, which I'm going to touch upon in a bit. Uh, yeah, I'm one of those that I've heard about circular economy, maybe hasn't been more than a year, probably, I don't know, seven months, eight months, that's it. So probably I'm the most knowledgeable person in circular economy, which I'm going to be, that's why I'm standing here, I'm going to be talking to you. Uh, right, but what I've, and my background, although that I, I, I do have an MBA, my background is I'm an engineer, an electrical and computer engineer, and a computer scientist. Yeah, so the MBA was a detour for me, but it proved, bless you, but it proven to be quite uh, instrumental to many things and to helping me understand the science bits of science of applied sciences. Uh, one thing now that I think I, it probably makes sense to, to realize and, and maybe you know, take it out there and make it public is that circular economy, it, it's, it's, we cannot expect circular economy, man-made circular economy because circularity is inspired by nature. Yeah? Man-made circular economy cannot work without information and the data-driven component. So I think the fact that we're talking about circular cities in the information and communication technology world, this is a quite natural title, and it's an expected title, because we cannot just say circular cities yeah, or circular economy. It has to be data-driven. Yeah, because again, if we go back to nature, it, it's like saying, uh, if we talk about circular economy without the data-driven component, it's like, having sex just for fun and pleasure, if you think about this. Yes, it's fun, it's enjoyable, it's all the stuff, but you need the information bit. Yeah? You need the, otherwise, yeah, you, 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 will, you will just, you know, the, the, the human race will be gone yeah? if we had sex only for fun, <laughs> only for pleasure. Yeah? So, and if you think about this, in the rest of the species, when they do this act of reproduction, it's, again, it's information-centric, it's information-driven. What do they want? They want to transmit the information of the species, they want to transmit it to the future. Yeah? So and I think these things are kind of falling into shape. So this was something that we were naturally doing. We're just putting names now and understand, trying to acknowledge and understand. We, we do like to put names onto, onto things. Yeah? And this is another challenge. But, First things first, who hasn't heard uh, of Bournemouth before? <laughs> I didn't, <laughs> really. <laughs> yeah, I've, only, I've been there for two, two years. Uh, here's where we are located. Yeah? So there's London, two hours uh, drive or two hours train. It's, it's a fantastic. These are real pictures. These are not from other places. This is actually from Bournemouth. <laughs> yeah? Yeah. It's not photoshopped. I'm not stealing. I'm not plagiarizing yeah, other locations, Mediterranean locations. This is it. And the thing is, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a very nice place. Yeah? Sorry? It's once a time Absolutely. <laughs> yes. So, uh, when I, I, I've been there for two and a half years, and when people were asking me, I've been, you know, where are you, you now based? I'm in Bournemouth. Where is that? They didn't even know that it was in the UK. That's fine. But two years ago, this happened. Oh, here's Bournemouth University, sorry. This happened. Bournemouth FC entered the Premier League. And then everybody knew Bournemouth. Yeah? So it's like, where are you, Bournemouth? Oh, you've got a fantastic team. Nobody talks about the university that I'm working. <laughs> yeah? Which is quite sad because it's an ambitious but, and, but very humble university. It's, only, it's a young one. It's only 25 years old. But they've been doing many interesting things, yeah? So, for example, let's talk about Bournemouth first. Bournemouth is the number two in the UK for international education. Yeah? 300 million per year uh, pounds are, are contributed to the local economy. It's the third financial center in the UK. The third financial center, Bournemouth. Yeah? First, it's London. Second, Edinburgh. Third is uh, Bournemouth. I guess now with the Brexit, we're going to become number two. Yeah, London, <laughs> London is going to be out. <laughs> yeah, so we're getting there. Right, and it's the fastest growing digital economy in the UK. It's number one 
for uh, high growth tech companies. And that has to do also with the location, because techie people like to be, they, they, they're, they're fed up with London. They, they're fed up with Reading and the Beijing Stokes, yeah? They want to be in a nice place. They want to go surfing and then code in the beach. Yeah, that's, that's what they're after, yeah? Um, and also the Bour Bournemouth Borough Council also uh, contributes a lot to that because we've got some good partnerships. Actually, in the ideal cities, we have their support, as you will see later on. Uh, okay, so a few other things in the department that I'm uh, head of. Uh, we've got pretty good computing students. Their average salary is 7,000 more per year than the expected salary. So they, they, they're really getting good value out of our programs. Uh, we've got uh, the National Center of Computer Animation. We've got the, uh, the students work on these uh, projects and we've got Oscars for these, yeah? In, for visual effects. Yeah? So these are the things that I didn't know when I went there. So we're doing a few things, but we're doing them quite well. We're quite proud of. Uh, okay, this is the Department of Computing. This is the size of the department. Um, the key thing is that the students, we, we push all the students to go on a, on, a, on a year placement because we've got the companies there, we've got the industry, we've got the banks, we've got JP Morgan very close to the campus. So they all go and gain proper experience. Yeah, they become, they grow up, yeah. Right. Uh, so let's start from the beginning. So I said uh, everything is about information and it was always about information. As you can see here, this is the first ever information system. Yeah. You can, we can say that this is a prehistoric Twitter. Yeah. So somebody thousands of years ago, he wanted to tweet yeah, to capture the fact that he, he hunted and he got a mammoth that big. Yeah. I guess back then, uh, retweeting was a bit of a challenge. <laughs> but anyway, but you can see that information was always, the, is, was always there. Yeah. Let's uh, skip a little bit, a few thousand years, and then computers came in. And now we're talking, when we talk about information systems, we, need, we, we talk about computerized information systems. So we had machines to help us do things much quicker. Yeah? So now, what, we can, what, what, what was back then, the, the, the concept of a computerized information system was to understand the world, to model things, to model the real world, to see how the world works and, and, and capture that in mathematical models and try to solve problems, yeah, which was great. But later on, the internet came, and this is the internet. This is a, an artistic representation of the internet. These are the, the different colors and the different domains. I think the blue or the, the green one is the dot com, which is the biggest. But this is what the internet looked like uh, about 15 years ago. Would you like to see what it looks today? Yes, it looks like this. So we are now the internet, because we've got, where's my phone? I lost it again, no, it's here. So uh, we are the endpoints now of the internet. We're 24 seven connected. We are, the, we are now, the internet is a socio-technical system. More than half of the population of the planet is connected. So what we do, we are the endpoints. We receive information, we process it, and we respond to something. So, so a socio-technical system is a system that is comprised of electronic components, computer components, and human components. And they have to work together to help to make something useful. Yeah. But the problem now is that is if we start talking about uh, socio-technical systems, we need to start talking about the human uh, aspect, the human element. And we are realizing that people, we, people, we beha we, our, our behavior is, is affected, is influenced, yeah, and it is conditioned on the cyber uh, world. We, d we, we, we work differently, we behave differently. And this is also modeled as well to an extent. There is a lot of research in the, in the cyber psychology discipline. By the way, what I didn't mention is that in the Department of Computing, we've got in the same faculty, that, uh, the faculty that computing falls under, we also have uh, psychology and we work very closely. We have a very good cyber psych psychology uh, group. So we, now we need to study, if we want to have a healthy socio-technical system, we need to take care and look after all the components, particularly the human components. 
Yeah. And this is a very dynamic and fluid environment, and people keep changing. Keep, people keep forming their, the, the way that they behave. Yeah? Uh, so one, one of the groups which I can, I can uh, kind of start uh, bringing together is, uh, is uh, what we've got the, the digital addiction. Digital addiction now is, is another, probably, you, you, you know exactly what I mean. Yeah. If you have kids, they're always <laughs> in front of a laptop, uh, try taking the laptop. They have this cold turkey syn syndrome if you, if, you, if you switch the internet off, uh, off in your home, yeah? including myself. I, 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 I couldn't book the taxi earlier because I didn't have connection and I started panicking. Yeah? <laughs> so there you go. So the digital addiction, what we do in digital addiction in Bournemouth is, is uh, on uh, persuasive computing, on persuasive software. So when you, for example, the, the, when, you, when you buy a pack of cigarettes, the pack of cigarettes has a label and it says, you know, if you smoke, you'll die. Yeah. But it, it doesn't know how much you smoke, it cannot react. It's just a label, it's a static label. With computing, with software, we can do a lot more. It can respond to things where it can, it can, you, can, you can program the, the, the system to detect if you're getting addicted or if you're using a device or a pro, if you're playing a game for too long. The game companies, of course, they want you to play, <laughs> to be addicted, yeah? So there are different agendas. So this is an example of IoT device trying to, to tackle uh, some uh, addiction problems. This is not, by the way, this is not our work. I just downloaded this from YouTube. Okay, guys, yeah. time for dinner. So you get the idea. So speaking of food, oh, so this is the next slide. Yes. <laughs> uh, and now we're entering. We're moving. No, we still have socio-technical systems, but we've got something on top, and that is cyber-physical systems. And now it's where it gets very interesting and very scary as well, because remember I told you that inform computerized information systems is about to create these models of the real world and, 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 and implement these models in a computer in the cyber world. Now, with cyber physical systems, what we're really doing is that we're adding a feedback loop. We are putting sensors and we're putting controls. And we started also putting AI, artificial intelligence. So a computer Understand, has its own understanding of, through the model, through the mathematical model, it understands the world. But now it has the option to influence the real world based on its understanding and take decisions. For example, here, let's say that the computer uh, controls the temperature. Uh, and the computer knows that, uh, we program the computer to say, you know what, this temp the temperature here needs to be on 20 degrees. If the temperature falls below, it is going to increase the 
heating. If it's above, it's going to sto stop the heating and start the, the climate control. Yeah? But what if we start introducing more complex uh, decision making, like an AI that we don't, we don't need to put a hard limit on 20, 20 degrees, and an AI that has face recognition here and it sees that the audience is bored yeah, and tired and maybe hot. Yeah? So it can say, oh, yeah, OK, I'll make a decision. And maybe yeah, it's 20 degrees, but let's cool it a little bit so people are going to wake up. Yeah? And this is a, a very simplistic scenario yeah? because we are talking about cars as well. We're talking about driverless cars. Yeah? The, bless you again. <laughs> so we're talking about, I mean, if you, has anybody been there in this venue? Yeah, you know what, that, it's not a car show, by the way. Let's have a different perspective, a different photograph. It's not a car show, and you, this is the, the hint. It's the 5G Congress in, uh, in, in Mobile Congress. In, was it Barcelona? Or Barcel it's uh, Barcelona. Cars in an IT venue. Yeah, this is what we're, where we're heading at. Yeah, and now, as you probably can guess, I'm gradually building to the, the, the smart city and the circular city. Yeah, because one of the services, it's, it's, it's not only using the cars, not that the, the Uber, Uber, which is one of the most successful taxi companies that doesn't have a taxi, or, well, they have now a few taxis, a few cars. Yeah, and Airbnb, the most successful, one of the most successful hotels without owning any hotel, yeah, because that's what circularity is about. We're talking about driverless cars as well. Um, so, driverless cars. UK publishes laws for robotics for self-driving cars. And probably you have heard many times the dilemma of the AI, of the car driving, driver, driverless car. Uh, if, if it has to, to if, if, there's a, if there's a situation where there's a pedestrian uh, and in order to avoid hitting the pedestrian, it will have to take a decision and kill and, and cause an accident that can potentially kill the passenger. What would it do? Again, this is a dilemma, or maybe they can be argued. And let's say that we've solved this. We can say that you know what? Yes, if I if I would be a driver, I would take care of myself. So it seems that we can program the AI. To, to say that, you know what, if you don't have that dilemma, always kill the pedestrian. Let's say that we sorted that. But will the AI be in a situation to always recognize and understand the context? Similar to us. Do we, do we always understand the context? Is this a bit out of our, is this implementable? Are these principles practical? Will, will they ever have a high TRL? Yeah? And to give you an example, a simple example, this is a research published a few years ago. Selfie accident, again, about, I love technology and death, as you see. By the way, yeah, if you think about this, circular cities, yeah. Cities will have to become smart cities in order to become circular cities. Yeah. If this doesn't happen, we're gonna, all going to die much sooner. Yeah. So anyway, uh, selfie accidents have killed more people than sharks this year. How do we do this research? How, what is the principle? What is the research methodology? Yeah? We, we phone all hospitals or we, get, we retrieve all records of, of uh, shark uh, attacks, that, fatal shark attacks, and then we, do, we, we, and we, we capture that. We, create, we have a number, and then we create another number with selfie accidents, and we compare these two numbers. Whichever is greater, we can go and write a very nice article about it. Yeah? I challenge you now to tell me whether this is a selfie or a shark uh, kill. Photoshop. It's photo well, it's, yeah, I think it's a Photoshop, but, <laughs> uh, but if, if we pretend that this is a real photograph, <laughs> yeah, see, and it's, it's not always straightforward. It's very difficult to put context always. The same kind of data can, can be interpreted in a completely different way, uh, ways. And it's not, it's not because there's subjectivity now here. There's epistemic uncertainty, as we, as we say. The, the, I cannot classify this. Yeah? It has nothing to do with subjectivity. So we need to keep redefining the problems. And, one, and again, I'm going to be... Uh, 
referencing malware, uh, software and malware. Even malware is, has completely blown out of proportion. Yeah, this is a very old, one of the very old viruses, which was just you know, a plane, a DOS virus. Yeah? But we, we have genuinely problems in defining what malware is. Yeah? If we have, for example, if you download a, a program that just deletes everything, does that mean it's a malware? Well, we don't, maybe, yeah. Or, but maybe it was some batch, some administrator created, batch file, some script, an administrator created just to clean their data. And you downloaded it, and the effect was completely, you know, that doesn't mean that it's malware. Sorry? It's malicious. Yes, okay. So what if I send you, if I, again, it can be, when you, when you want to classify something though, you've got antivirus. It, will the antivirus classify it as malware or not? Yeah? That's the, that's the, the question. It, it should, yeah, yeah. Yes. 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 Yeah. Stuxnet. Is it malicious? Well, yeah. it's definitely malicious. It's a game changer, but it, that, it didn't do anything to the rest of the world except the, that computer in Iran. They were very close to doing it to the rest of the world. Yes. Yeah. 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 All right. So. I will be referencing security, cybercrime, uh, digital forensics throughout the, the presentation, by the way. So one of the things that we need to start understanding is that, okay, we were in a complex world, and we, now we want to have smart cities, meaning that these smart cities will be also in the, in the cyber plane as well. So some distinction, which will help us, is the distinction between conventional and cybercrime. In uh, conventional crime, the offender is present in the crime scene. The, the crime scene, most of the times, it's well defined. Yeah, we know we, we can put the, the ribbon. This is the crime scene. This is the body. This is the crime scene. This is, this is the search area. Yeah? In uh, cyber crime, not, the crime scene is ill defined. Conventional crime. One cr crime at a time, multiple crimes. Yeah? High risk, low reward. Low risk, high reward. People are most of the time, if they know what they're doing, it, they can be anon through going through proxies, through VPNs, anonymized through other countries, which have different legislations, and so forth. Uh, in the conventional crime, we have local investigation, whereas in the cyber crime, we've got international. Most of the time, well, it, it may lead to international if it's a high-profile crime. And in conventional crime, it's reported, and in cyber crime, it, it has something really bad needs to happen because there's also the, 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 the fear of the reputational damage. So now, the problem now with a, with a smart city is that both of these apply at the same time. So we fear that there are going to be, let's call them opportunities, or more complex attack vectors that will, <coughs> that will encompass both sides. Yeah. And we, we need to start thinking of the, these extremes, these the outliers, even when we do risk management. In risk management, everything works very well within the, within the boundaries, but if we start talking about the extremes and the outliers, that's where the models start collab not only risk management, in, but in many models. That's where our assumptions are, don't hold. And when we have many attacks happening at the same time, and orthogonal attacks happening at the same time, maybe the risk, and the, uh, the, the damage would be proportionally bigger. And this is something that we need to consider when we start opening the cities yeah, and adding technology and connectivity. So this is the Ideal uh, Cities project. Uh, the partners, these are the, the, the six partners. Now you know uh, BU as well. Nice to meet you. <laughs> um, and it's supported by uh, Bournemouth, uh, a few councils and municipalities, and a charity organization, Guide Dogs, Guide Dogs UK. And the, uh, uh, if, if you need 
to take away from some one thing to take away from the, my presentation is this, which is a reference <laughs> to Ellen MacArthur Foundation. By 2050, 75 percent of the population will reside in cities, and I think that says all. We cannot continue living as we do and expect to have the same quality of life with all this waste going on. The man-made waste, yeah? the human-made waste. We need to start again listening to what, how nature solves the problems and nature uses information which comes in different shapes and forms. Through, you know, even at the cellular, le cellular level, there's some stimuli that makes, that makes the, cell, the cell do something. It, it, again, data-centric, information-driven, yeah? And this is, and the, uh, and the ideal cities uh, has a little bit of emphasis, focuses on this, of course, uh, on developing a, a platform for this, but focuses mainly on, on security aspects and social inclusivity aspects through the use cases, which we will see in a bit. So this is, again, another uh, interesting infographic, let's say, encompassing all the aspects of a, of a smart city, uh, but from a perspective, from the project perspective, from the ideal city's perspective, uh, this is what we're aiming to uh, develop. This is the infrastructure. And if you, uh, Vivek mentioned SDNs, software defined networks, so although that the SDNs are, the software defined networks are here, this whole, this structure, it's like a, uh, an, a, another representation of a SDN type of philosophy. Because down here, we've got the, the devices and the objects and the IoT stuff. Uh, we've got a middle layer which, does, which has all the controls. And then we've got the application uh, layer. And you will see security uh, throughout. Sorry, it's not very clear. Apologies for that, but I don't need to uh, bore you with, the, with many details. Uh, but the, the main concept is IoT and participatory sensing. So participatory sensing, so it's crowdsourcing um, and crowd sensing using, since we've got many users and we've got many devices, all the devices and users will, will all contribute to uh, providing uh, data so the, the system will be able to make intelligent uh, decisions and optimizations. Um, one other success story from, uh, from in my department is we've got another research group, uh, a research group, the FlexNet, Future and Emerging Networks Group, and uh, recently they managed to get the, the approval to develop the ITU standard for crowdsourcing. So the, I, the ITU is the standardization body, where, which is the UN standardization body, and every standard becomes a, a legislation once it's uh, ratified. So we, if you see at some point the crowd sensing and crowdsourcing standard, it's one of the research groups in Bournemouth that are uh, developing it, that would have developed it. So the two main use cases, which I think are f fantastic use cases, both of them, uh, is one is assisting the movement of visually uh, and uh, mo mobility impaired uh, people, and that through the contribution also, and, through the, and this is what got, we got, why we got the support of guide dogs, so, in a, uh, and it has nothing to do, it's not only about the visually and mobility impaired people, but it touches healthcare as well. So, imagine having, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll show you a video in a, in a bit for the visually impaired, a, a, a primitive kind of application on, uh, which can take us to the smart cities and circular cities uh, initiative. Uh, uh, but if you think about, uh, the, the wider healthcare uh, and implications and how quality in healthcare can be increased in, in a circular economy and in a smart city context. Uh, imagine a, a person with a, a pacemaker uh, and that, that person has a, let's say they have a, they're working in the city and this is IoT pacemaker, so it keeps reporting or it can report, has some connectivity and that person has, uh, has a heart attack in the middle of the street then the, 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 a smart city or a circular city, if it's a fully integrated and it has healthcare services, it would detect that. Uh, it would send a message to the, to the hospital. So the ambulance can be on its way very quickly. The traffic lights can be reprogrammed to control the flow so the ambulance can go quickly. 
participatory sensing means that if there's a, a doctor nearby, they can also be summoned. There may be a doctor that they're, they're in Bournemouth and they're, they're in the beach. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm from Greece, and there's many times in, 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 in busy beaches, there's an emergency, and the first thing you, you hear is, is there a doctor nearby? That, is there a do that can be done automatically, or quasi-automatically. You, you agree that the privacy, of course, implications are huge here, so that doesn't mean that, but that, that has also been solved. There are protocols. So there is the protocol which is called the nearest doctor problem, for example. So if there are 10 doctors in here and somebody has a heart attack, yeah, only the closest doctor will, doctor's location will be revealed and all the others are going to be, you know, the privacy is going to be preserved. So that's the one uh, example. The other one is increasing citizen safety through life logging. Now life logging is, again, reporting and giving your information on how you, you know, your, your, your working patterns, your moving patterns, and it can go down even to your emotions. Yeah? So there are emotion sensors. So an emotion sensor can detect that you're walking, for example, in a, in a street at night which is, you, you feel a bit stressed, that will be picked up. And now if the, the luminosity of the street is low, it can, be, it can increase automatically to give you more comfort. If you still are stressed or if the system, if it's detected that you're being attacked, then the cameras can start recording in HD or full HD uh, and the police can be uh, informed. So we're talking about an ecosystem that works as a whole. Yeah? And participatory sensing again means that, you know, if there's somebody that has subscribed to a service, to Neighborhood Watch as we have in the UK, Neighborhood Watch means that there are citizens that can offer services, police services if needed. They can also be summoned. Yeah. But in order to do that, you need to have timely, correct information yeah? in a, and in real time or near real, in, in some cases real time and in some other cases, softer cases, in near real time. And you need a cloud or some kind of processing service that will you know, be aware of the context yeah? and the, the state of the intelligent devices. Yeah, or the intelligent assets that will <coughs> orchestrate the, the decision making and deliver these high services. And this, as I need to repeat again, that these services need to be offered uh, at some point because of that Ellen MacArthur uh, re report. 75% of us are going to be living in, you know, there's a lot of urbanization coming, coming in the near future. So we need that. It's not, it's not an option. Circular, so circular cities is not an option anymore. It's not a nice to have. We need that. Okay, so uh, this is another company that we started kind of collaborating with. Uh, and there were, uh, through, we met them through Guide Dogs. Uh, this is, again, I said, it's a, I think it's the first stage of participatory help and... Uh, um, actually, let me just play it. Ira offers a personalized service for blind and low vision people to help them gain greater mobility, independence, efficiency, and self-assurance. Although Ben is completely blind, he has confidently learned how to navigate the streets of San Diego with the use of his cane. Though Ben manages quite well, there are certain unexpected situations where he can get into trouble. Fortunately, he's wearing his Iris smart glasses, and when he either senses that he's in a terrain he's unfamiliar with, or his cane tells him information that he still can't discern, he simply activates the glasses with his finger, and instantly, Chloe, his Ira agent, sees what he's about to confront and tells him how to proceed. Chloe is a certified agent who is trained in aiding blind people whenever they tap their Iris smart glasses. Hi, Ben. This is Chloe. She has a mission control style dashboard where she can see what Ben is looking at, where he is located on Google Maps, and any potential obstructions in his pathway. Hey Chloe, it's nice to hear your voice. It's good to hear your voice too, Ben. How can I help you? I need some help in my directions. I'm meeting a friend of mine, Bob McCarthy, at La Hattis Restaurant for lunch, and my usual route is blocked. So could you help me get there on time? Sure, Ben. But first, can you help me get situated so I can make sure you're in a safe spot? Can you look around so I can get a thorough view of your surroundings? Since Chloe can now see exactly where Ben is by way of the video cameras in his smart glasses, she can help Ben orient himself on exactly what's going on around him. You're actually pretty close. I think the fastest way to get there is by taking the MTS. 
you can jump on the train at the Little Italy Station, which is on West Cedar Street, and take that to the Convention Center stop. So turn back around and walk towards Pacific Highway. And then I will be happy to give you some more information. Okay, let's go for it. I'm just gonna move it because then not, not much is happening. Chloe can see Ben's progress on Google Maps on the screen. So she gets away. Thanks, Chloe. Chloe clicks on the social tab on Ben's profile and can see that he loves seafood. The agent dashboard then pops up a Yelp menu of the Las Hadas Cafe. From your profile, Ben, I see that you love seafood. Las Hadas' signature dish is enchilada del mar wrapped in a handmade crepe with broiled lobster and shrimp. Sounds delicious. Thank you, Chloe. The restaurant entrance is at 10 o'clock. There's a hostess on the patio ready to greet you. Ben, I see Bob sitting outside at a table about 15 feet straight ahead. Chloe is able to identify Bob because of his Facebook picture that appears on her dashboard. Hey, Ben. So you get the idea, and you can see how this can be further improved now if we, can, if we have more devices, uh, more uh, devices that can set even more the context uh, to, to help the, the, the person navigate. Actually, I spoke with one of the users of uh, IRA last week, and they're using it for also, they're not using it only for navigating through the city. He said uh, that he, he, he ordered some, uh, some device that needed assembly, but the instructions were not in uh, text, so he could not use the OCR. It was in graphics, in diagrams. So he used the IRA, thing, he used this technology to, to assemble to have somebody to describe them. And he said that he did it in a, at the, he di, it didn't take him longer to assemble than a person that had uh, direct access to the information. Okay, so I talked about the, the pacemaker. I've got another problem, another challenge for you. Uh, we've got this, let's say, John. He's got an IoT pacemaker. And as you know, devices that are that have computers on, on them or primitive computers, they are connected. They can be, they are vulnerable, they can be, they have vulnerabilities. And how do we get rid of the vulnerabilities? We do updates, we do patches, we do system updates. The million dollar, dollar question is that who's going to do an update on John's pacemaker? Is it going to be the nurse? Is it going to be the doctor? Is it going to be a computer scientist? Who? Is it going to be the, his grandson because he's good with computers? Yeah. So you can see new roles emerging, especially in healthcare now. This is, this, I think this is a very a key role because let's say then in this scenario that in the middle of the update, this happens. This means that John may be dead. This is literally the blue screen of death. Yeah. So it's critical now. So you can imagine now the, uh, the needs and the challenges we will be having. And it's not a, just a simple IoT device anymore. It's part of a critical infrastructure because it, has a, 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 it will have a huge uh, impact if something goes wrong. So the security challenges, if we want to summarize them, would be to First of all, how are we going to protect these critical infrastructures? And where are the boundaries of these critical infrastructures? What is the boundary? Critical infrastructure. If we say that critical infrastructure is something that has, uh, will have a societal impact, a big societal impact, well, I can, you, you probably have heard that in, in the States, people call 99911 when Facebook is down or when they cannot, lo when they cannot log into Facebook. They call 911. <laughs> is that critical? <laughs> yeah. And security and privacy, as you can imagine, because now we're, we're collecting or siphoning in a lot of information, not from users and people, but also from devices. Yeah? Now, SCADA, uh, re, re, try, trying to tie now with Vivek's presentation, uh, PLCs. PLC is a, is, a, is, a, is a civil computer that is, is found in many SCADA and industrial control systems. This is just an example. And uh, it, basically, it has in its simplest form, it has two elements. It has a switch, which is an on-off switch, and it's a coil, which is like a magnet that makes things move. And that's it. 
and it's completely programmable with something called the ladder, the ladder logic. So you can create any program you want with these switches and coils. Yeah? And you can load this program on the PLC. Now the problem is that safety yeah, is not, it has to be programmed. So let's say that we've, we're controlling a, an engine yeah, and it has a forward coil to make the engine go forward and a backward coil to make the engine go back reverse. reverse. So we need to make sure that if, the, if, we, if somebody presses the forward button and the, uh, and the, uh, uh, the, the engine is, is spinning in reverse, then the forward button will have no effect. Yeah? And that's what, what these red things do. These are programmed. If they're programmed, they can be easily deprogrammed or modified. Yeah? And this is, this is the risk. And there is a protocol, an ancient protocol, that these devices communicate with. It's Modbus. It's called Modbus. And now there's a version over Ethernet. Yeah? The problem with the, with the traditional Modbus is that there's no security in there. And that's where it, we, we need to, why we need to start talking about security by design. Because there's also many legacy systems as well. And you need to make sure that if you're using Modbus, for example, if you're sending a Modbus signal to reprogram a PLC, it's not going to be the end of, this, uh, of the world. You, you're not allowing that command, that reprogramming command, to reach a critical component. Yeah? And this is what we mean by security by design. But you'll be surprised how many industrial systems don't follow security by design principles because they're just too old. But the other, oh, this is the protocol that I don't need to focus on this. Uh, I'm conscious of the time, that's why I'm spinning it a little bit. The problem is also the expectations. Dan talked about changing the... Dan, oh, I lost Dan. Uh, he talked about the, 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 the business people and the stakeholders and the old mindsets, and we need to change the old mindsets. Well, this applies also in the industrial world, in the SCADA world, because there are the traditional SCADA engineers and safety engineers that focus on hardware and electronics, and these guys have a completely different way, a uh, different view of the world from the IT guys who perceive different risks and different threats. And these need to be talking together. They're not talking at, uh, most of the time. They're not talking. So they, they need to change also the way they see things. And in that mix, we're introducing now new services. Yeah? And we're introducing citizens as well. We're talking about citizens. Because if we're talking about a circular city and a smart city, we're talking about users that are citizens. How do they perceive the risk, how, risks? And how do they identify these risks? And also, another good example is incident response. Incident response is one of my favorite subjects. Because that's when you realize how difficult it is when you've got a, 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 a list of security controls and responses, you realize that in, in, in most of the cases, you cannot use them, depending when you, where you are in the, in the, on the chain. Yeah? So if, you're, if you think security as a martial arts, yeah? if you're in the end user, or if you're a small company, you're more like Kung Fu kind of guy. You're Bruce Lee, meaning that you, have to be, you can be abrupt. You can pull things. You can have strict firewall policies. You can have a firewall policy to block everything, and you don't really care. If you're home and you see that there's something wrong, you just pull the plug, and that's fine. If you're an ISP or an NSP, if you're, if you're part of the critical, if you're offering the services, you can't do that. You're more of Tai Chi. Yeah? You're, not, you're not hard martial art, you're soft martial you, 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 What do you do? You, 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 you navigate, you redirect the flows, the network flows. Yeah, so you've got the flows, you take them over here. You make, you make security somebody else's problem. Yeah, you're more gentle. But you still need to do security only from a different perspective because you cannot pull plugs. You cannot be Bruce Lee. You have to be Tai Chi. Yeah? Uh, you've heard of that as well. That is also a game changer. That's a cyber physical attack. And that's what terrifies me in, in smart cities, these kind of uh, attacks. Yeah. And again, in the mix, we also have AI as well. We have the AI component, which we haven't modeled yet uh, fully, because that can be another adversary. <coughs> uh, yeah, there's even ransom. Uh, if you heard of ransomware, there's even chat capabilities for ransomware. 
if you have a look at, it's always a human problem. If you have a look at, you, sorry, you cannot see this very <coughs> well. These are proper chat logs where, for people talking with criminals, trying to retrieve their files, their encrypted files. And it's, it's, so, it's so surreal. You would see there is a customer, there's a victim that thanks them for the services because they helped him to decrypt the files. Somebody says, I'm going to give you five star reputation kind of stuff. The criminals. <laughs> Yeah. This is very scary. So, and hardware, anybody can access any kind of hardware. So all the IoT devices, yes, they're easily collectible. You can, you, can, you can acquire them, but even things like ATMs, you could. You can go on eBay with seven. So if we empty our pockets, probably we can buy an ATM, take it home, and pull it apart, and find its vulnerabilities, and start attacking other ATMs. Yeah. So this is, these are all the challenges now, and I'm hoping, yeah, in summary, am, am I done with time? This is my last slide. So, yeah, read, read the, the slide, I think I'm done. Any questions? Thank you. Thanks.